So welcome to uh, the, the last part, syllabus area number four. This is looking at the significance and evaluation, that is historiography, of Albert Schwer. So this slideshow is going to look at kind of the areas where there is significant debate, uh, historiographical debate that is, as well as some of the main authors. So let's have a look. First of all, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, what have we got here? First of all, his relationship with Hitler. His involvement with anti-Semitic activities in connection with the Germania project, that's often uh, nicknamed the Jew Flats part of it. His use and his abuse of forced labour when he was the Minister for Armaments. Uh, his knowledge of and links with concentration camp systems, so how much did he know about them? How much did he know about what happened in them? Did he ever visit them? Things like that. Uh, e, his reaction to the scorched earth policy, so he actually said no to Hitler on this at a time when very, very few people did that and lived. Uh, and there's a question as to why he did that. So that's the main thing. We know he did. The question is, was he trying to save his own skin? Was he being kind of, you know, uh, nationalistic and saying, no, Germany needs to go on, etc. Uh, F, the significance of his work as Minister for Armaments and War Production to the overall German war effort. So Albert Speer loves to play up how much of an impact he had as Master of Armaments. How much did he actually do? How much of an improvement in the munitions factory production, in plane production, etc., was there? We know there was a significant amount. How significant was it to the overall war effort? And finally, was he the good Nazi overall? Looking at all of that, what was he overall? So, Speer and historians. Apparently, this is loading. Interesting. Uh, so, initially, whilst uh, in Spandau, that's the prison, uh, don't write spandex, which some people write accidentally in their, uh, in their final HSC and gets a chuckle out of us. Uh, in there, Speer wrote his own memoirs. He wrote them on little bits of paper that were smuggled in. He wasn't supposed to at all, and he did, smuggled in. Uh, so, in that, he presents himself as the penitent technocrat who chose to know nothing about the persecution of the Jews. So the idea of a, of a technocrat is this kind of like a person who just sticks at his job. He's very, very good at his job. He doesn't think about the politics. He doesn't think about the idealism or the ideology behind what he's doing. He just gets given a job and he does it to the best of his ability. So he, he's sorry that he did his job so well, but he's emphasizing the fact that he just did his job. Uh, initially, most historians affirm this view. Most historians said, yeah, that's all right. Uh, but as new evidence came to the light, people began to question, especially historians, the validity of his account. So Schmidt, uh, Matthias Schmidt and Van der Vat being two of those people. So what did, himself, what did he himself write? Three things there. So we've got Inside the Third Reich, that's his memoirs of the time that he was within the Third Reich. So growing up uh, and his time within the Nazi party, then obviously during the war, then spanned out the secret diary, so that's his time within the prison, uh, and then slave state Heinrich Himmler's master plan for SS supremacy in 81. So massive tomes usually uh, that you know, took a fair amount of writing. They had, people helped write him as well, so he, he had some help. So perspective, so we'll have perspective for each of these books. So he presents himself as a technocrat, that is hardworking but not political. Suggests he knew nothing about the Holocaust or the persecution of the Jews. All right, so he, he talks as little about it as he can in the books and he actually, uh, what's the word? He plays down the knowledge that he has. He claims that uh, he kind of, he could have found out more but didn't. And that, you know, he wishes he had, etc. And what would have happened if he had found out more? Um, so he, he presents himself as, as someone who knew nothing about it, A. And B, he's penitent. He's, he's sorry. Uh, but he has this new idea, this concept of collective responsibility. He says everyone in Germany was responsible. Some to different degrees, but everyone's responsible. And he should have known. He should have known. And therefore, he's sorry for that. And he should have done something to stop it. But he didn't know. So it's this, this funny idea of collective responsibility. Followed up, we have William Hampshire. He's one of the, the most uh, positive spare authors, historians. Um, really gives him a great rap. So Albert Speer, victim of Nuremberg. Straight away, you can tell what it's going to be like just from the title. 
So his perspective, he thought Spear was telling the truth at Nuremberg. He was very sympathetic to Spear. To Spear, thought he was hard done by at Nuremberg. Note that he's writing in 1970. He's writing before a lot of the information came out. Okay, so he's writing a, a piece of work based on the information that was available then. Taking everything Spear said at face value. Matthias Schmidt, however, he writes Albert Speer, The End of a Myth, uh, 12 years later in 1982, is subtitled The Book That Exposes Albert Speer's Falsifications of History and His Real Role in the Third Reich. So, how did he get this? Uh, an unedited version of Walter's Chronic came out, so this is a guy that was writing and wrote a, a whole heap of information about, for example, meetings that Speer was in where he must have known stuff was happening with, with forced labour or slave labour. He must have known where they were coming from. He must have... The Jew Flats is a big one. Um, so a lot of this is... Um, it's, it's pretty damning, the unedited version of Walter's... And it, did, it didn't come out till Walter died. That's why it's 1982. He dies, we find a version that has not been edited and all of a sudden there's all these extra accounts in there where you just go, oh, hang on a second, hang on a second, there's, a, there's minutes from a meeting, and it's got Speer actually signing the, the, like the um, bit around the side, what do they call that bit? The margin. He's actually signed the margin to say he was at that meeting. We, we never knew he was in that meeting. And the Jew flats were talked about in that meeting. And often signing was a way of saying, I'm here, I agree with what we've decided. Okay, so things like that, really damning evidence. So that's 1982, Matthias Schmidt. Gita Sereny. She writes uh, in 1995, so we're another, what, 13 years after Schmidt. Albert Speer, His Battle with Truth. This is not a, this is not a, uh, a work that seeks to find and kind of judiciously look at all the evidence. She's, she's writing from a psychological approach. Okay, so it's a different school of history. Okay, if you, want to, if you want to talk about historiography and the different historians, he's writing a, a she's writing uh, based on a whole heap of interviews she's done with Speer himself. So she asked to interview him, and she and she does interview after interview after interview, and she comes to grow to kind of like him. Uh, so there is there is kind of a positive, and she kind of she basically says uh, that he was able to like literally block out things that he should should have known. She claims he psychologically was able to block things out so he could work better at his job. Um, yeah, quite interesting. Uh, but that's that's her point of view. No, it, it's his battle with truth. Not we're, we're not battling to find out the truth. It's his battle with the truth that he knew. That's the idea. David Vandervat himself, the good Nazi, the life and lies of Albert Speer. Note the uh, the irony in this title. This is why I'm pretty sure uh, this was taken from Van der Vat's thing there, because he's got a little uh, email address. If you want to ask him a question, he's happy for you to email him. Uh, we'll see We'll see on Thursday if that's the case, if, if he says it again. Perspective. Uh, so he lived as a child, so this is Van der Vat, lived as a child in Nazi-occupied Holland. Uh, Van der Vat initially worked as a journalist. He wrote about Speer, but refused to use Speer as a source. All right, wasn't happy with, with Speer. You know, it's the person you're looking at. He's basically saying, why would you use him as a source? Surely it's incredibly biased what he's saying. Uh, and shown to be biased. By the time he's writing, it's shown to be very biased. Um, obviously, the title is a play on words. It's very critical of Speer. It's not the good Nazi. Uh, so that uh, he questions Speer's lack of knowledge uh, and uh, him being an apolitical technocrat. So Van der Vat, one of the things Van der Vat says is that He's actually very political. He's actually very... He claims he wasn't very good at anything like that. And Van der Vaart has, has examples that really basically show that Speer was very good at getting what he wanted and very good at um, playing the system and playing Hitler himself to get what he wanted. At one point claiming that he should take over the Nazis if Hitler died. It should be Speer to take over Germany. Then we have Joachim Fest. He wrote Spare the Final Verdict in 2002. 
He wrote Albert Speer Conversations with Hitler's Architect in 2005. He was also the editor of Inside the Third Reich. So Joachim Fest was uh, the one that actually helped Albert Speer write his own memoirs. So, interesting perspective here. This, this, this person obviously knew and worked very closely with Speer. Uh, so, Fest lived as a child through the Nazi regime. He's German. Uh, he served in the German army in World War II. Uh, he, he tries to defend his role as Speer's editor. He tries to say this is what he was doing and why he did it. Um, but he condemns Speer for his complicity with the Nazis and for knowingly hiding this at Nuremberg. So, so Fest claims that Speer knew that if he told them at Nuremberg how much he knew and how much he worked with the Nazis, he would get hanged for sure. Uh, and so he... Yeah, he condemns Speer because Speer basically hit it uh, very, very well. Uh, he, did, he does ex accept that Speer, as many Germans did, compartmentalised his thinking, so he didn't think too much about the moral aspect of what he was doing, uh, because he said a lot of German people did that as well. There's a little bit of uh, kind of social commentary. Fest is he's thinking about the German kind of psyche and how is it that so many people manage to, to do so many atrocious things and not for a second stand up and go, you know what? I would actually rather die than help you kill half a million people. If you think about it, it's not going to take too many people to actually do that to stop the Nazis. There are only so many SS. Uh, if you think about it, it would have been very easily, easy for, for a mass movement of people saying, no, no, enough is enough. But it never happened. Now, you know, people would say the entire German country, the entire German nation was complicit in this. Um, for that one, he, um, he focuses on uh, Speer's relationship with Hitler himself, looking at writings and various other things.